Today, I am talking about probably one of the most influential people in the entire history of this country. A true visionary, of course, Alexander Hamilton. When he was 10, his father abandoned him. When he was around 12, his mother died of a fever in the bed next to his. He was then adopted by a cousin who promptly committed suicide. And during those same years, his aunt, his uncle, his grandmother, uh, they all also died. Then a court, a court in uh, St. Croix took all of his possessions and sold off all of his personal effects and gave the rest to his mother's first husband. And by the time he was a teenager, he and his brother were orphaned, alone, and destitute. Within a decade, however, he was effectively George Washington's chief of staff. He organized the American Revolutionary Army. He served bravely in combat. Within 20 years, he was one of New York's most successful lawyers and had written a, a large portion of the Federalist Papers. Within 30 years of that, he had served as the Treasury Secretary and forged, uh, well, created the modern financial and economic system that is the basis for American might and uh, the economy today. And within 50 years, he was dead at the hands of Aaron Burr. His greatest achievement came as Treasury Secretary, however. He was confronted with an economically weak and fractious nation. He nationalized the debt, he bound the states together, and created fluid capital markets that are the engine of world capitalism today. He was working at a time when many people around him saw an entirely static and unchanging view of economics. They scorned credit, they scorned banks, they didn't like the stock market. They considered manufacturing to be the least productive form of economic activity. When he was Treasury Secretary in the 1790s, there were only five securities traded. Three of these um, were Treasury securities created by Alexander Hamilton. The fourth were shares in the Bank of the United States created by Alexander Hamilton. And the fifth were shares in the Bank of New York which was the first private bank of New York, which was also created by Alexander Hamilton. Can you see a pattern here? He literally created the entire infrastructure of Wall Street as we know it today. When he became Treasury Secretary, the country was bankrupt, to say the least. Uh, American debt was selling for 10 or 15 cents on the dollar, which is a ridiculously low amount. By the time he left office five years later, the country's credit was as good as anybody else's in the world. Most revolutionary countries, and that's what ours was, uh, would have simply just repudiated the debt, said, we're not going to pay it, sorry, not going to happen. But Hamilton thought it was important to honor that debt, and he provided the country with an economic and financial maturity that enabled it to give the Constitution and federal government a fair test. The most pressing problem facing the new government, uh, of course, a lot of them were economic. As a result of the revolution, the federal government had acquired a massive debt of $54 million, including interest. The states owed another $25 million. Uh, paper money that was issued on the Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation was literally worthless. Foreign credit was completely unavailable. Nobody was lending us money anymore. The person assigned to the task of resolving these problems was 32-year-old Alexander Hamilton as Treasury Secretary. He designed a financial system that made the U.S. the best credit risk in the Western world. The paramount problem facing Hamilton was a massive national debt. The uh, proposal was that the government assume the entire debt of the federal government and the states. His plan was to retire the old depreciated ob obligations, all the debt that had been put out there initially, by borrowing new money at a lower interest rate. However, some states didn't like this because Maryland, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Virginia had already paid off their debts. So they saw no reason why they should be taxed by the federal government to pay off the debts of other states like Massachusetts and South Carolina. His critics also claimed that his scheme would provide enormous profits to speculators who had bought bonds from a bunch of Revolutionary War veterans for as little as 10 to 15 cents on the dollar. For six months, a bitter debate raged in Congress until James Madison and Thomas Jefferson engineered a compromise. In exchange for Southern votes, Hamilton promised to support locating the national capital on the banks of the Potomac River. That's right, Washington, D.C. was put in where it was just so Alexander Hamilton uh, could have the economic system he wanted to create. 
Hamilton's debt program was a remarkable success. By demonstrating Americans' willingness to repay their debts, he made the United States attractive to foreign investors. European investment capital poured into the new nation in massive amounts. Hamilton's next objective was to create a Bank of the United States, which was modeled after the Bank of England. A national bank would collect taxes, hold government funds, and make loans to the government and borrowers. One criticism directed uh, at the bank was that it was unrepublican and that it would encourage speculation and corruption. And the bank was also opposed on constitutional grounds because it's not strictly uh, mentioned in the Constitution that is able to do so. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison charged that the National Bank was unconstitutional. And those were the guys leading the charge against it. But he responded, Hamilton responded by saying that the bank was constitutional by formulating the doctrine called implied powers. Not explicit, not enumerated powers, but implied powers. He argued that the Congress had the power to create a bank of the Constitution, granting the federal government the authority to do so, because uh, they can do anything that is necessary and proper to carry out the constitutional functions. In this case, they had fiscal duties, so they needed to be able to have a bank in order to do so. In 1791, Congress passed a bill creating a national bank for a term of 20 years, leaving the question of the bank's constitutionality up to Washington. The president uh, reluctantly decided to sign the uh, bill out of a conviction that the bank was necessary for the financial well-being of the nation, but he didn't necessarily think that it was completely constitutional, uh, and that is before we actually even had judicial review, so that's a fun thing. Uh, finally, Hamilton decided he wanted to aid the nation's infant industries, not farming, but industries, through a high protective tariff designed to protect American industry from foreign competition, also government subsidies, and government-financed transportation improvement projects. He was hoping to break Britain's hold on uh, America, because Britain still had a manufacturing hold over us. We could not manufacture that much ourselves, and he thought the only way for us to go forward is to be able to do the manufacturing ourselves. The most eloquent opposition, of course, from Hamilton came from Thomas Jefferson, who believed that manufacturing threatened the values of what he believed was the Amer way America should go forward as an agrarian republic, the way of life that he envisioned. Uh, it challenged, uh, they challenged each other. Hamilton's vision and Jefferson's vision challenged um, each other. Jefferson envisioned farmers tilling the fields, communing with nature, maintaining some degree of personal freedom by virtue of land ownership, whereas Alexander Hamilton uh, had a very modern economic vision based on investment industry and expanded commerce. The economic vision that had um, no place for slavery was Alexander Hamilton's. He actually started forming anti-slavery societies shortly after the end of the Revolutionary War. Before the 1790s, the American economy north and south was intimately tied to the transatlantic uh, slavery uh, trade. States in the south of Pennsylvania de depended on slave labor for tobacco, rice, indigo, and cotton. Northern states conducted the most profitable trade with slave colonies in the West Indies. And a member of New York's first anti-slavery society, uh, Hamilton wanted to reorient, reorient America away from slavery and away from colonial trade. Though his economic vision more closely anticipated what, it, what a, the America would become eventually, by 1800, Jefferson's vision had basically triumphed. Um, his success resulted in from a lot of factors, but it's one of the most important was his ability to paint Hamilton as an elitist, because he was, uh, but also as a defender of a deferential social order and an admirer, admirer of monarchical Britain. Basically, he's saying not only he's an elitist, he's a monarchist, and that was a bad thing. But Jefferson also pictured himself, or painted a portrait of himself, more or less, as a proponent of republicanism, uh, equality, and economic opportunity. Hamilton doubted the capacity of common people to be able to actually govern themselves, so yes, he was an elitist. Jefferson's vision uh, had an egalitarian republic of a bunch of small producers or farmers and craftsmen and small manufacturers. He had a powerful appeal for subsistence farmers and urban artisans fearful of factories and foreign competition. And increasingly, those numbers, um, those voters began to join a new political party, which was being led by Jefferson.